Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sri Garan I go by Sri. I'm here to talk about super speed interchip. Uh, we have a couple of names on this presentation, but needless to say, there were a lot of many other key individuals who contributed to SSIC, many of whom are here in uh, this maybe face to face. So if you have any nice things to say, please come to me. If you have to complain, I can give you some names. Okay, so we're going to go over what is the motivation for SSIC, give an overview of this uh, interface, and talk about the different layers, talk about the prototype work that was done, some of the compliance and interop work that's coming up for SSIC 1.0 before we summarize. Please stop me anytime if you have a question. So why USB 3? Um, as we know, USB is well established as an interface for external ports, but USB is also used widely inside the box in mobile products. There are interchip versions of both USB 1.1 and 2.0 that are used in the industry. Specifically, HSIC is used widely for modem and wireless LAN applications. And there are advantages to using USB. There is a um, extensive software infrastructure, hardware IP, verification IP. There's a lot of reuse that could be leveraged. So SuperSpeed is a natural transition going from HSIC. You get to reuse a lot of the software and the device drivers, some of those layers we'll talk about. There are a lot of optimizations in the SuperSpeed protocol over 2.0, power management optimizations. For example, some of the polling issues that we see in 2.0 are fixed in USB 3. Um, and as we talked about, we get to reuse all the hardware and software infrastructure that's already in place in a lot of SOCs today, especially as USB 3 adoption starts to ramp up um, starting this year and going forward. Uh, however, super speed as is does not meet requirements for interchip applications. It's uh, too expensive from a power perspective, perhaps from a uh, diarrhea and EMI perspective, depending on your implementation. So there's a need for a interchip version of super speed that's optimized for short channels inside the box. <clears throat> that provides scalable bandwidth. Because USB 3 works only at 5 gigabits per second, and for your internship applications, you may not need just one. So there's a need for to have multiple uh, bandwidth operation points. Well, and what do you know? M5 maps very well to the requirements for internship, and this is obviously by design. A lot of you don't need any introduction to why M5 works very well for internship applications, and hence. We have this manager here. So you combine the software model and all the benefits of SuperSpeed protocol with the optimizations that come with the M5 physical layer, and that's where we have SSIC. So this is a representation of the USB stack. So at the top, you have the device driver and application layer, which could be something like a, a modem or an NCM device driver. Underneath, you have the USB system software, which is your uh, bus driver and your controller driver on the host side and the device side. And then typically going down, you have actual hardware, which is the protocol, which which uh, generates the actual uh, packets for transmission. And then you have the link layer and the physical layer underneath. So what is shown here is uh, the SSIC stack. And it's the portions of the stack that are modified for SSIC are colored in yellow. So mainly the main change is that the physical layer has been modified. So to take out the USB 3 protocol completely and replace it with a MIPI M5, uh, add a PA layer so to speak, for managing that M5. And there are some limited changes in the link layer to accommodate for the M5 change. But everything in the protocol layer and above is unchanged. And that is the whole value proposition of SSIC, is that all the existing software stack that's been put in place and being verified does not have to know that it is not talking on standard super speed, it's talking on SSIC. It's completely transparent to the software. 
That was the value proposition. And this is give, showing an example of one way to implement SSIC. This was taken from the specification. So uh, as we talked about, there is a lot of infrastructure out there and this includes hardware IP, both on the host side and the device side. So it makes sense to take an existing hardware IP for super speed and add a PA layer, which is shown here, which does the bridging logic going from pipe, which is the standard for interfacing the controller and the file in USB 3 to RMMI. So this PA layer would take care of all the M5 adaptation logic scrambling, lane management, burst framing and such. And, oops. And there would be some additional modifications needed as shown in order for the PA layer to function properly. Now this is of course just one example of an implementation. The spec doesn't talk about what layers you have to have in SSIC because the Compliance is done on the wire, the actual bits on the wire. So you, you, you could take the existing link layer and completely rewrite it so that it natively supports RMMI coming up. So this is just an example. But since a lot, the expectation is a lot of implementations will follow this model, there are implementation notes in the spec that talk about, well, if you're using this model, here are some implications. For example, if you go to Hibernate, a transition may involve doing a certain operation in the PA layer. So that was the overview and then we we'll go over the layers one by one. So on the physical layer side, we use the type 1 and 5 and support all the high speed gears uh, up to whatever capabilities are in the M5 2.0 spec. The, uh, PWM gears, only G1 is used. Uh, there is a protocol called RR80 that is defined. We'll talk about that. Now, the, since the M5 supports many different optional features and capabilities, and M5 modules may vary depending on the vendor and depending on the capabilities, profiles are defined in the SSIC spec to aid in interoperability. The concept of a profile is that it's, it's, there's a no formal notation which denotes the profile formally. So G talks about what gear it operates at, R is the rate series, and L is the number of lanes. And the uh, spec defines if you are operating in, for example, high speed gear one profile, here are the capabilities that you have to support at a minimum. For example, your sync length has to be, your receiver should be capable of syncing uh, within a certain sync length or less. And the thinking is that if you have a host and a device that are both operating on profile gear one, they both will come with the knowledge of what capabilities they need to support at a minimum. And there isn't a need to actually discover capabilities and to configure M5 registers. As long as the profile is in agreement or that this is the profile they both operated, in theory, you shouldn't need to actually touch any M5 registers. But the spec also defines a protocol if there is a need to modify any M5 registers because the profile defines a minimum capabilities that need to be support. For example, the implementation may be able to sync much faster than the minimum length, say 16 symbols needed. So in that case, an RR80 protocol is, which is a very simple protocol defined that is used in PWM G1 mode right after power up that is used to read and write registers at the remote end. So using this protocol, you can read and write any one of the M5 registers, or uh, you come up from power up, this, the simplest command that you may get is just go to profile one, and that's the only register command that is sent. And both sides know exactly what profile one means from an M5 register and a capability perspective. So as soon as you get that command, you're uh, ready to operate in high-speed gear one. There are also some vendor defined registers uh, down. There may be uh, some applications that uh, are needed to operate in, high in PWM G1 mode even before high speed gear 1 is uh, reached, for example, maybe with just boot ROM support. So there are some vendor defined registers by which you can use uh, RRAP. 
And as mentioned, it's only used in M5 low speed mode. When you actually go to high speed, that's when the super speed protocol is uh, used. So, um, as you know, in M5, as soon as you get a line reset or a power on reset, the default is to go to PWG1. So that's when other AP is used. So anytime there's a power on reset or warm reset, which is a super speed uh, mechanism for resetting the link through software, or there is a disconnect. So we'll talk about disconnects from a USB context. So anytime these events are reached uh, or uh, seen, other AP is used. And as mentioned, it's a simple protocol to access M5 registers. You can tweak M5 settings using firmware. And uh, it's also used for implementing the M5 test mode. So that was the physical layer. Um, in as much detail, deep dive we can do in the half an hour we, can, we have allocated today. Next up is the link layer. So the link layer, is based, the, the specification defines an LTSSM, which is the link training and status state machine. There's a state machine defined in the spec that is based on the super speed LTSSM. Now, the uh, concept of an LTSSM is that it defines link behaviors, not the implementations. So, there isn't an actual uh, definition of how this LTSSM state is communicated to the PA layer, for instance. The idea is that when you are in a certain LTSS system state, what the behavior of the wire will be, that is the uh, that is what is documented in this section. So the SSIC LTSSM defines is is defined, and there are, it's basically a few changes from the super speed LTSSM, and also shows how each one of those states are mapped to the M5. So, for example, the RX detect state out here that is entered every time you see a power on reset. That is used to detect the link partner. So, that is the receiver detect state. And once you get a power on reset, you enter the RRAD mode and the low speed mode. So, once the link partner is detected, you go into the next LT system state. In this state, uh, the super speed training sets that are used to train the phi in standard super speed are mostly preserved. So even though the M5 is trained using M5 mechanisms, the training sets are sent again in SSIC. And for two reasons. One is uh, it minimizes the modifications to the upper layer. There isn't a big impact to any uh, latency or any functional state. And second, it enables closed loop file training. So anytime there is an issue, the unlikely event that the M MRX does not train using the sync symbols that are mandated in M5, the training sets that are there in the in the polling state include your standard comp symbols and your standard symbols, which are nine um, uh, transitions or more, allow the MRX to train. So in polling, there is no actual useful functionality sent. Uh, any useful data sent, it is mainly meant as an additional stage for training the MRX. So if for some reason your MRX does not train, uh, in polling you can detect that and be able to train once more. The recovery state is used to retrain the file, and this is done. Uh, this basically functions the same way as polling does, except when you're coming from a lower power state, such as hybrid. And there is a new state called M5.test that is used for uh, implementing the test features of M5, such as loopback. Now each one of these LTS system states are mapped to M5 states as mentioned and this includes the lower power super speed states as well. So for example the U0 state, the U0 state is the functional super speed state when actual data is transmitted on the lake. This maps to high speed burst or stall. So when no data is being transmitted on the link, automatic stall entry is supported and this is done transparent to the link layer. 